Shalom everyone. What is meant by being under the law and being under grace? We need to understand these things in our reboot of our theology to understand how does the law fit in with God's grace. And, and so join me if you will for this episode of Reboot the Root presentation of Above the Law. Shalom and welcome to episode three of this exciting series about God's law. So appropriately named, the title of this series is called Above the Law. And we are continuing here in episode three to talk about whether or not that God's law is still applicable and expected of believers today. So before I get started, I want to thank you for joining me on this Reboot the Root episode. And, um, and if you don't know what Reboot the Root is, I encourage you to watch my, uh, my episode um, on, on, the, on what Reboot the Root is, and it's called The Narrow Road. And I believe it's a three-part series of understanding about how we need to have a, a, a process of retooling our mind, rebooting, resetting, and uh, re-examining what our beliefs are, what our Christian beliefs are compared to the Bible. So that's what Reboot the Root does is I'm encouraging you to take a look at everything you believe and find the backing, the spiritual and scriptural and doctrinal backing in the Bible for your beliefs. And we might be surprised to find that there might be some uh, retooling that is needed for our doctrinal statements of belief. So that's Reboot the Root. Like again, again, I say welcome to this episode three of this series called above the law and I call it above the law because there are a lot of people in their doctrinal beliefs when they say that they're Bible believing Christians that um, that they seem to have an attitude that the law does not apply to them so we're continuing to reboot this understanding of do we need to have the law in our lives because we have been taught theologically that the law is either for Jews or it, it's been done away with. So we're re-examining this idea of God's law. So before I get started, I want to start off with a couple of quotes. Uh, one of them uh, is in scripture. In fact, uh, Yeshua said it. And if you've ever watched my other episodes, you know that I, um, I use Jesus and Yeshua interchangeably. Why do I use Jesus if I am a Messianic believer? Well, because I have a mixed audience. Some people out there are using Jesus as the name of the Messiah, and there are other people who are using Yahshua or Yehoshua or Yeshua as the Hebraic name. So my personal belief is that we should be using his original name, but I understand that we live in an English-speaking world, and so we're accustomed to calling him Jesus. So in order to have this teaching available to everyone, I may use Yahshua uh, interchangeably with a Jesus. So my, uh, my belief is that uh, Jesus is simply put as the English translation of the Hebrew name of Yahshua. So this scripture I'm going to quote to you is about the law not being destroyed. And this is quoted by Jesus or Yahshua in Matthew 5 verse 17 and it says do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them and we go on from that to quote Charles Spurgeon who says Jesus did not come to change the law but he claimed to explain it and that very fact shows that it remains for there is no need to explain that which is abrogated so I could not put it any better than Charles 
Spurgeon. So we understand that, that uh, Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he didn't come to abolish or destroy or to do away with the law, but he came to fulfill it. So in this sense, fulfilling really means that Yeshua came to teach us the law and to teach us the heart of the law. He, showed, he came to show us what it is to walk and to live out his instructions. So he, so he did not come to do away with the law. So a lot of people will teach that God's law was destroyed at the cross. Well, God did not come to die for his law. He came to die for the, for the breaking of the law. He came to die specifically for sinners. So it is us who have broken God's law. We have transgressed and we have racked up sins. So God came as his son Yeshua to uh, die for our sinner, for sinners, that is us, who have broken God's law. So that challenges the doctrinal error that says, that suggests, even while they would not say it, that Jesus came to do away with his law. And he did not do that as we see in Matthew. Uh, so we want to take a look now at what the law is. So let's give a little history about the law. So we, know, we look at scripture specifically in the book of Exodus. We see that God's law was given at Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai was roughly um, a few days journey from Egypt but it took them took the children of Israel 50 days to travel there after they were delivered at Passover so God's law was given at Mount Sinai and it took took them about a 50 day journey of getting there from Egypt and so when the children of Israel get to Mount Sinai a lot of interesting things happen there. One of them is that the law is given to Israel through the mediator Moses. So Moses is a mediator. So um, what's also happening here at this time is God is creating a ketubah. A ketubah. Ketubah is a Hebrew word for a contract. It's like a marriage contract and that's exactly what's happening here at Mount Sinai is that God is proposing to Israel, his bride, to take unto him Israel, who will be a special people to him. So this Torah that's being given at Mount Sinai, it is also a ketubah or a marriage contract. So the Ten Commandments of Stone becomes a marriage contract or the ketubah between God and Israel. So this law, which is commonly known through scripture as the law, is also called the Mosaic law because it was given through Moses. So this Mosaic law also exists as the Mosaic covenant. And so we, we read throughout the Torah that there are hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of Mosaic laws that are given throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if one, one was to count them, would be quite a, a, a task. Uh, Jewish uh, tradition suggests that there are some 613 laws that started with the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments are also known in Hebrew tradition as the Ten Words. Alright, so I'm not really sure if there really is 613 laws. There might be more, might be a little bit less, but that's the idea. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws that contribute to the law. Now, as one might suspect that like in our nation, there are laws that do not apply to all groups of people. And that, is the, that holds the same with the Mosaic Law. There are laws for women and there are laws for men. So as a man, there are laws for women that would not even come into play for me. Likewise, for my wife, there are laws that would not come into play for her. 
There are also laws for that only apply to you living in the land. Laws for Levites, laws for agriculture, laws for dealing with the temple. So there are a lot of laws that may not even apply to us. But that does not mean that God's law in general does not apply to us even as New Testament, New Covenant believers. So this, this law that God initiates at Mount Sinai is the law of the covenant. It's the law of the covenant between God and Israel. So some may say, well, see there, you see it's laws just for Israel. But in my other teachings, I have gone through you with you about what it constitutes being a Israelite. So I'm going to give it to you in a very abridged form. If you are of Christ, meaning you're a Christian, then you are of Abraham's seed. And we see that in the book of Galatians. And so if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you have also accepted all of the lineage that comes with him that started off with Abraham. So Abraham is the father of our faith. He became the first Hebrew and out of his seed came the Messiah. And so that's why that when we are of Christ, we are also of Abraham's seed, which makes us Israelites. So the, the Ten Commandments and God's law would apply to us. So when we look at the law, we, we may think of that the law really started at Mount Sinai. Well, that's not really true. So if we look at John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. From that very first verse of the book of John, we notice a little bit of theology that maybe we have missed over is that God's word, which would be his law, existed right at the beginning of creation. So God's word existed before there was creation because we know that the word is also Jesus or Yahshua. Jesus or Yahshua is the word of God. The word of God was used in creation. So the word was there at creation. So that being said, we would have the law was already in place before creation. So the law existed at creation, probably contained in the forbidden tree, uh, which Adam was commanded not to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it's my belief or my supposition, a theory if you will, that this law was contained inside the forbidden tree and when it was violated, it was all of the knowledge came out of it, uh, including God's law. So uh, even the Sabbath existed at creation, which is a law. Um, in fact, in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is the fourth commandment. So the commandment of the Sabbath, we already know, existed at creation because on the seventh day, God rested from all his work he had done at creation um, and then he goes on in Exodus chapter 20 to tell us that we should also rest. We all should also keep the seventh day as a rest day, a Sabbath day. So it's plain to see that God's law existed at creation. When this tree I was telling you about, the forbidden tree, was violated, this law of Moses may have already been may have been released at that time so the law existed before mount sinai we see that the law existed before mount sinai because we have the sabbath given on the seventh day of creation also we see that there are things that happen with noah like the dietary laws so we see that it also existed with noah uh, God's law, when we read about it in the Torah, we see that it is detailed in Leviticus, Numbers, and is recounted in Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is actually called the second law. That's what Deuteronomy uh, also means. Um, so Deuteronomy in Hebrew means uh, debar or words. And, and so when Jesus or Yeshua 
comes to dwell with us in human form as God, he comes to explain the application of his law. He doesn't come to do away with it. And if we really look into the writings of not only the gospel books, but the Pauline letters, all the New Testament books, we see that there's a heavy influence of the Torah upon the New Testament writings. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of God's law? Well, just like in, in our uh, society, we must have laws or we have degradation of society. We have unrest. We have anarchy. We have um, a lack of order. And so that's what the law becomes. It becomes a standard for us to live by. The law becomes the standard for how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to direct our lives. It answers a lot of situational questions that will come up that we didn't answer for. And when we need an answer, we are going to go to God's law to tell us how to live. So when we live the Christian life, we are often living a life that may be void um, in comparison to not having law. If we don't have a standard or law to adhere by, our Christian life can be empty because we're lacking direction. And so if you ever think about this, when someone comes to Christ or Messiah in salvation, they become born again. It is explained to them that they are sinners. So if we were to tell them this is why you have sinned, because you have broken God's law, they realize that they are sinners and they're in need of a Savior, and they give through their life to Christ, and they repent, and they become born again. They are saved. But then... What happens after that? During the discipleship process, uh, we st people start teaching them to not do God's law. They teach them not to keep the Sabbath day. They teach them not to eat biblically clean. They teach them not to keep God's feasts, and so on and so on and so on. And so we get right back to becoming people who walk in a sinful life, just like we were before. We may not have the same kind of sinful life, but we still are in disobedience of God's law. And so that's what really sin is. And if we can explain that to people, that when they, they realize they're sinners, help them to realize that they have been disobedient to God's law. They have been rebels. So it doesn't make any sense to bring someone into salvation and then encourage them to go back into sin. We should be walking away from sin. New Testament believers have this appearance that they are only concerned with New Testament scriptures to live by. But we have to understand that we get the influence of the New Testament scriptures from the Old Testament. So when we encourage people to just start off reading the New Testament, it becomes a little confusing because we haven't read the first part of the book. The New Testament will become mystery, mysterious to us if we don't know the back story of what we're reading that's behind the New Testament. The New Testament will become confusing and hard to understand when we don't have that information of the Old Testament. It's like reading a novel starting at halfway through and you're confused as all heck of what happened before then. Um, so this this thing that New Testament believers seem to really just be concerned with New Testament scriptures, which makes things all the much more confusing, because we don't we don't we we're missing the law part that brings us the understanding of New Covenant scriptures. Misunderstanding of the New Testament verses under English thinking and culture is a main problem with people mis uh, not being able to understand what is being spoken about in the New Testament. So we are trying to understand New Testament scriptures that was written in a Hebrew culture, a Hebrew thinking, and a Hebrew language. We're trying to understand all that with English culture, English language, and an English mindset. And th because of that, we're, it's no wonder we are going to have problems of understanding the Hebrew Scriptures in the New Testament. 
Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, the New Testament was written in Greek. Well, that's a yes and no thing. Yes, it was written in Greek, but the Greek was a translation, at least I believe it was, of, it, of Hebrew scriptures. So it, the New Testament was written by Hebrew-minded people, such as Paul. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament, but he had a Hebrew mindset. He spoke, I believe he spoke Hebrew and Greek, maybe some other languages, but the language and the concepts of the New Testament were first and foremost Hebraic. So if we want to understand the New Testament, we have to understand it from a Hebraic um, perspective. Christian behavior is often organized by New Testament scriptures, but we should be understanding Christian behavior from Old Testament standards and Old Testament instructions. Now that doesn't mean that you can't, that you, well, we do not use the New Testament to guide our lives. No, not at all. But we must understand that it is the Old Testament that gives us our Christian standards, our instructions, and our behavior to live by. If you take out all the Old Testament laws, there would be nothing left for Christian behavior. Uh, let's go to some scriptures now. Uh, Psalms 119. So we're going to talk, these are scriptures that we're going to be talking about the law. In Psalms 119, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Oh, that my ways were redirected to keep thy statutes. So that's that last part I want to I focus on. David, who wrote the Psalms, he is saying that his way, he wants his ways to be directed to keep God's statutes. And in the beginning of this verse, he says, Blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Um, they do no iniquity. Iniquity is another word for being lawless or to be evil or to do something corruptly. Um, so we are looking to do things God's way with our whole heart to seek God and to not wander away from his commandments. And to requote what he says at the end there, he says, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Uh, in Romans 3.20, it tells us what the definition of sin is. So this is very important when you're doing evangelism with people to show them what sin is. So we could be in a very embarrassing moment when we try to tell someone, do you realize you're a sinner? And they will say, well, what does that mean? What have I sinned against? Well, we tell them they have sinned against God's laws. But Romans 3.20 is a better definition. It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we're comparing sin against God's law. We're comparing it. So if we, are, if we don't even know what God's law is, then how would we know that we have sinned? Romans 13 verses 8 and 10 says, For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So here is another definition um, that may take us a whole lifetime to really realize its application is that we must approach God's law with love in our hearts. If we do not have love in everything that we intend to do with God's law, then it is a work of our flesh and not by the Spirit. When we're approaching God's law, we have to approach God's law with spirit and with love. In fact, I think that's why Yeshua came, is to teach us how to do exactly that. So if you have, love, have loved one another, you are fulfilling the law in your life. Uh, 1 John 2, 3, it's a very powerful scripture. It says, and hereby we do know that we know him. And we're talking about if you know Jesus or Yeshua. 
and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments do you love God do you if you love God then you will keep his commandments and so we need to know what those commandments are if we're going to keep them in order to show our love to God so I've used this idea before is that keeping the law is not the basis of our salvation but it is the fruit of our salvation so if you want to see the fruit of a believer you will see them walking in God's commandments it's not something you say well I'm a Christian I guess I better do his commandments no those come automatically because you love God It is the fruit that is produced uh, no man can keep the law or its commandments for his salvation just like I was saying before is that keeping commandments is not the root of your salvation but it is the fruit salvation is a free gift you don't do anything to earn it it's not something that you trade for it salvation is a free gift all you have to do is ask for it so there's no commandment keeping that will give you salvation and we look at this idea that is very true that we have preached it in evangelism to other people is that we have preached that the wages of sin is what it's death so we know that sin is defined as the trespassing of God's law when we break God's law we sin so it doesn't matter if we interpret something as a sin what God says is a sin is a sin um, and there are scriptures that say there's a scripture that does say that it what if whatever is sin to you is sin so it's the sin idea that brings on the wages of sin and but we also have the gift of life for, um, that Messiah brings us by putting our trust in him for salvation so you don't you have to decide do you want to be on the wages side or you want to be on the gift side one you will earn you you can earn a wage of sin but you can also receive freely the gift of life keeping God's law becomes the standard of how we walk with God so if you've ever wondered how do I walk with God what what is God's marching orders what is his instructions for me well that's very easy we study and we perform God's law as the standard it is something that we um, we are looking to obtain okay so we are looking to keep God's standard in his law commandments like I said before are the fruit and not the root of salvation we are saved as born-again believers we are saved from the breaking of God's law but we are not saved from God's law so let me put that in a different way do we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins or do we believe that he died for his law so that we don't have to do his law anymore well hopefully you pick the first one <laughs> so Jesus came and he died for sinners he didn't come to die for his law um, we 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 look at this idea about the trespass rather than the law so when we are sinners in need of, of a savior we are the trespassers we have trespassed God's law but it's not God's law that was bad it was it was the transgression of the law so the law is not the offense but is the breaking of the law that's the the offense like for our example in our own country we have thousands and thousands and thousands of laws much more than there is in the Bible but the laws that we have on the books aren't necessarily the problem it's the breaking of those laws so this is going to be a good spot to say uh, goodbye for episode three but 
don't worry, we'll be back for episode four when we will continue to talk about this exciting series about the law. We'll be back for episode four of Reboot the Root presentation of Above the Law. You don't want to miss next episode because we're going to continue to talk about the idea of the law for believers. So for now, I say shalom and invite you back to come back for the reboot. Also, subscribe to this channel and like if you haven't already done so. Shalom.